You know, I just realized something. This is the second theory video in a row I've done that's involved some kind of chest. On the plus side, that's a very humorous coincidence, but on the downside, this spits in the face of all well-known logic. I mean, as scientific fact is stated for years, first is the worst, second is the best, and third is supposed to be the one with the chest. Huh? <sighs> okay, that, that sounded a lot funnier in my head. Can we, like, cut out that intro and post and just go right to the video? So I've been getting back into Amphibia again, as many people have, and it's provided some much overdue smiles and laughs during these quarantine times. These quarantine times, if you will. <laughs> Sounds like a newspaper for epidemics, but whatever. And while it's been fun to react to episodes live, I've been itching to dig my shoes into some proper cartoon theories again, both for this show and its magic avian cousin next door. And what better way to start than one of the biggest mysteries in all of Amphibia? Okay, second biggest. There you go, the Calamity Box. The chest of mysterious origin that brought Ann and company to the strange land in the first place. Now, like many people have pointed out, this is not just some typical piece of antique furniture teleports a kid to a fantasy world situation. Oh no, there is definitely something bigger going on here. Something that potentially involves life lessons, societal reconstruction, and some kind of ultimate evil hiding right under our noses. And with that arises some important questions. Who made this box? Was it made in the human world or brought there by someone else? Why did each girl go to different locations when they opened it? What's the significance of the three gems on top of the box? Why did it only work once and now lies in a dormant colorless state? And if the magic of the gems was transferred to the girls, does it have any kind of effect on them? Well, with a passionate outlook and crushing an ability to go anywhere else, I've taken it upon myself to answer these questions based on what we know so far. And I'm gonna start by talking about the chest itself, as well as what some people are referring to as calamity powers. Odds are more info will be coming up quickly as we get more episodes. And if it does, I'll adjust my theories accordingly, like I did with Steven Universe. But for now, sit back, relax, and allow me to craft you a grand... Dang it. Allow me to craft you a grand narr... Dang! Craft you a grand... A grand... Gah, forget it! Allow me to craft you a grand narrative that answers this show's biggest questions. <sighs> Ruin the moment. Anyway, let's discuss The Calamity Box Conspiracy, Part 1. We shall begin by analyzing what we already know about this little chest. Well, it was tracked down by Marcy and found in an old thrift shop, it was strangely displayed on a cabinet which adorned the Amphibia logo, after it was opened it teleported all three girls to different locations in Amphibia, and after it was used once, it couldn't be used again. Plus the color on all three gems disappeared, turning them grey. Now this isn't a lot to go off of on its own, but there are multiple hints in multiple episodes that can help us understand what this box is and how it works. Now I already mentioned that the three gems on the lid of the box all turn grey after Anne and friends hop dimensions, and that's likely meant to imply that these gems have magical origins and were drained of their power after this hop was done. But this power didn't just dissipate into the ether, as many people have pointed out, it was likely absorbed into the bodies of the three girls after they teleported. I mean, how else could you explain why Anne has been feeling so blue lately? But that brings up some important questions. Why is Anne the embodiment of the blue gem specifically? Why didn't she get magic from all three gems if all three girls teleported at the same time? You could just say that magic is weird or twas just fate and leave it at that, but I think things run a little deeper. <laughs> from where I'm standing, I believe that each of the gems on the box represents a different virtue belonging to a certain species in Amphibia. And the girl that best embodies each virtue deep down is the one who received that gem's magic on the trip over. And to explain what I mean, let's go over each individual gem, the girl they're likely attached to, the girl's main character flaw, and the group in Amphibia they befriended. Trust me, everything will start to make sense eventually. First off, we have the blue gem, which I believe represents bravery. And if the constant hints haven't made it clear already, Anne is the embodiment of this virtue. We've seen many times that Anne's main character flaw is that she'll often withhold her opinions or objections if she thinks she might lose a friend in the process. Like if she thinks something is a bad idea, she'll still go along with it because she values her friendships and doesn't want to do anything to mess them up. And this makes sense because she's now in middle school, which is a completely different beast compared to elementary school. You know, changing schools, different social environments, rising pressures, your early teenage years, stories of friends drifting apart at that point, and her low self-esteem and various quirks probably makes her think that making new friends in a new school would be almost impossible, so she would have a huge desire to hang on to the friends she already has by any means necessary. 
even if it means sacrificing her moral compass to do it. But the more time she spends in Amphibia, the more we see just how brave she actually is underneath that timid surface. Not just physically brave by fighting off giant bugs, toads, and other monsters, but also mentally brave in ways. Like in my favorite episode, Wally and Anne, where she lets go of her internal fear of letting labels define her, and after doing so, is more comfortable just being the real Anne. And of course, her bravery arc reaches its conclusion in Reunion, where she's forced to conquer the final hurdle of bravery in her mind, standing up to Sasha and telling a close friend, no, I'm not doing this, and you can't make me. You're not gonna push me around anymore. And let me just say, that was such a satisfying moment to witness. What further supports this theory is that every time a blue glow is shown with Anne, it involves some kind of brave behavior or action. Holding back the giant mantis and Anne are beast, blue glowing eyes. Fighting off the veg former and handy Anne, again, blue eyes. A vision of hunting down wild animals to feed her family and Anne Hunter, blue tipped arrowhead. Actually tracking down her family after they're taken away by the Scorpileo, blue hallucination of Sprig. And fighting against Sasha on Toad Tower again in the new intro, glowing blue sword. All are instances of Anne being brave in some way, so it makes total sense to assume these connections. And of course it's not just Anne who winds up more brave because of her arrival, the other frogs rise up and follow in her footsteps. When she gets beaten down in Toad Tax, the entire town unites to stand up to the Toad Overlords and follow her example of bravery. In Reunion, she's the one to both lead a daring escape and stand up for the frog's honor, and they all rally behind her. You can even argue that Anne had an influence on Hop Pop in a way. He started off very restrictive and by the books, and in some ways he still is, but after seeing how willing she was to take risks and be brave, like in Planter's Last Stand for example, he probably felt more motivated to take chances himself, leading to decisions like running for mayor. Anne is in every way a symbol of bravery amongst frog kind, and they never would have gotten to where they are today without her. The pink gem we don't really have any evidence for yet, but I like to imagine that this is the gem of kindness, and its magic is embedded in Sasha. Now I know what you're thinking. P what? Sasha? Really? The massive manipulator who uses friendship and kindness as a leash and or stepping stone whenever she wants to acquire something or get ahead? How is she the embodiment of kindness? Well, hear me out. Sasha, from what I can see, is a very complicated character. The first impression we got of her is that she's an awful, manipulative, fear-mongering person. And who can blame you for thinking that? She uses fake kindness and threats in order to get a leg up in life and to keep her friends and allies right where she wants them. She scared Anne into doing what she wanted in Reunion, and helped grime fake friendships with the Toads just to get closer to Anne and Marcy in Prison Break. I mean, she straight up says that you just gotta be nice to people and they'll do anything for you. Everything about her from the sneaky looks to the sneaky attitude makes it look like she's just using it as a tool for her own personal gain instead of genuinely believing in the power of friendship. She sounds like a terrible person, and in some cases, she kinda is. But again, you gotta look at potential context. She's in the same environment as Anne back home. A different school, changing social environments, many stories of friends drifting apart. But instead of caving to her friends every command, Sasha wound up doing something different. She planned to go right to the top of the student hierarchy, basically becoming the boss of the school in a way. Head cheerleader, super popular, getting to the point where students wouldn't dare mess with her or risk social status or even physical violence. With this kind of power, she basically assumed that her friends would never be able to leave her. If they tried to leave, she'd scare them into submission, and if someone else came along, they'd feel too threatened by her to do anything. A backwards philosophy on keeping friends, obviously, but I'm guessing that she was just doing all she can to keep them by her side, just in her own misguided way. You can even use this to explain her reckless behavior, where she felt so empowered that she thinks she can do anything regardless of consequence. And of course, a little bit of this rubbed off on Anne. In general, Sasha's just as afraid to lose her friends as Anne is, but she took on more domineering traits, creating a safety gate of manipulation and fear to ensure that her friends would never leave her. But when Anne finally stands up to her and that safety gate is smashed through for the first time in a long time, she gets a cold splash of reality and realizes what she's been doing. Wow, those frogs are willing to lay down their lives for her. And look at me. She... she hates me. Maybe... Maybe she's better off without me. And this of course leads to Sasha letting go of Anne's hand, putting her friend's life and safety before hers in the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. This was the first surefire sign for me that Sasha truly was a kind person beneath the surface. I mean, think about it. If Grime didn't swoop in to save her, this would have been the last thing she ever did. 
self-sacrifice for her friend's well-being. It's not a turning point like Anne's actions in that episode were, but it is a first step and a sign that she'll soon embody kindness later down the road. As for Toadcatcher, the latest episode, it starts with Sasha filled with rage and anger, smashing up training dummies of the planters. Heck, this one of Sprig is practically Melon Lord Jr. <laughs> It's obvious that she's very quelled up with mixed emotions, mostly guilt and anger from her recent confrontation with Anne. Heck, for all we know, her old fear-mongering tendencies might be coming back. Like, you know what? No, the problem wasn't the fact that I was a bad friend. The problem was just that I wasn't strong enough. I lost to Anne because I wasn't powerful enough to keep her. I gotta double down. I gotta train harder. I gotta beat Anne in a duel so she'll submit, and then things can finally go back to the way they were. Further shown by how she doesn't destroy the Anne-shaped dummy, and just kinda knocks it down and stands over it. But after a heart-to-heart -heart with Grime, it's obvious that she still understands how true friendship works, as she makes friends with Grime the old-fashioned way, by just supporting him, caring for him, and protecting him. No strings attached. With this new grand plan of putting a Toad army together, I'm hoping that this will be the big demonstration that will show off Sasha's kind nature, meeting soldiers one by one, getting to know them, actually befriending them instead of just pretending to like she did with the original Toad army. Instead of the Toads being the guys that can help me get to my friends, they'll now be the guys that are my friends. This will be a Toad army built on mutual respect and kindness for each other, instead of lies and deceit like last time. And it'll come from both the captain and the second in command. And maybe we'll start seeing some parts of Sasha glowing at some point. Or maybe your heart will grow three sizes that day. We'll have to see. Also, I don't think that sinister look at the end is meant to imply that she wants to kill Anne or anything. I think she still wants to bring their friendship back together. It's like a parallel of the ending of Prison Break. Well-meaning intentions through unorthodox methods. In this case, storming a capital and toppling a government. You toppled the South American government, Carl! The people have spoken. Viva la resistance! And lastly, we have the Green Gem, which I think stands for knowledge. Or more likely, the willingness to spread knowledge. And this one will likely belong to Marcy. Now, this is the trickiest one to explain because we know next to nothing about Marcy or the Newts at this point, but from what little we do know, I think this connection does make some bit of sense. We know for a fact that Marcy was the one that discovered the Calamity Box in the pawn shop and informed Sasha about it but we never find out exactly how she discovered this box. Was there some kind of informant? Something she's not telling the girls? Could she be withholding some important information? Maybe that's her main character flaw, where she doesn't always tell the full story, just enough to get her friends on board with something. That's a definite possibility, and I could totally see an arc for her where she learns that you should never keep secrets from friends, because that leads to dishonesty, dishonesty leads to doubt, and doubt leads to broken friendships. I mean, the fact that she's holding the Calamity box in the intro with her back turned might imply that she knows something about the box that she's not going to share with Anne when they finally meet up. And by extent, the Newts might know something about the box that they're not going to reveal, among other things. Again, I know this one's pretty short, but come on, I got nothing on Marcy at the moment. Aside from the fact that she likes wearing hoods and capes in the dark and posing dramatically. Maybe her life lesson will be to accept the fact that she's Batman, I don't know. Now, if this concept is actually true, where each gem's magic is attached to a girl that embodies that virtue, then what does the magic do exactly? Well, I like to think that the magic acts as a guide for the girls as they go through their journeys of self-discovery. It's possible that the magic in each gem sensed something in each girl and was drawn to them, so it's going to do all it can to help the girls unlock all their emotional and mental barriers that keep them from unleashing their full potential. The magic itself is not a substitute for development, instead it's like a gentle push that helps the girls along their path to development, like a guru patik in their minds that helps them unlock their chakras, or something like that. Now, I've also seen some people predict that the gem magic also gives them superpowers, like super strength and super speed. I'm kinda on the fence about this. The only two instances of Anne possibly having powers are when she holds back the arm of a giant mantis bug in Anne or Beast, and when she runs up the side of the veg former ninja style to take it out in Handy Anne, both of which involve her eyes glowing blue. I don't know, we've seen that Anne is both very athletically inclined and skilled in combat in multiple episodes, so it's not a stretch to assume that this is just raw skill. And besides, if these kinds of actions or abilities were out of the norm, don't you think Anne would question them at some point? I don't know about you, but if I turned into Ninja Gaiden or Hulk Hogan for a second, I would be wondering, Whoa, how the heck did I do that? That was amazing! 
Okay, what about the blue sword in the intro? That's gotta be a superpower, right? Well, I see that more as symbolism than an actual ability. From what we've seen of Anne, her main character arc is pretty much concluded. She overcame her main character flaw, rose up to become a brave protector of Wardwood, and even encouraged the frogs to stand up for themselves as well. She truly embodies bravery now more than ever, and the blue glowing sword is meant to reflect that. Meanwhile, Sasha's blade isn't glowing pink or green or anything, symbolizing that she still has a long way to go before she truly embodies her virtue. Pair it with the fact that the blue glowing sword doesn't seem to be any more powerful in any way, and I just see this as a visual metaphor for Anne completing her path of self-discovery and Sasha still needing to work on hers. Though I will admit, seeing Anne swinging around a blue lightsaber would be pretty dang cool. Anakin Skywalker, anyone? So overall, yeah, I think the magic gems are simply there to guide the girls along their paths and help them unlock their true potential. But hey, still plenty of episodes to go, so I could be wrong. And now we come to the final big question for now. How did the gems get this strange virtue-based magic in the first place? Where did it come from? Well, I like to think that answer lies in this well-hidden mural that's right behind the title in the intro. Based on the cracked and old appearance, it seems to be some kind of prophecy. It's kind of difficult to see, but if you look close, you'll notice three silhouettes representing Marcy, Anne, and Sasha fighting against some kind of gigantic, grotesque frog creature. Look closer still, and you'll notice a gem in place of the monster's eye and some kind of diamond shape on its forehead. If this creature has two eyes, which, you know, frogs kind of do that, and this forehead mark counts as a gem, that would make three gems, just like what we have on the box. So here's what I'm thinking. I think that a long time ago, even before the valley was populated, the frogs, toads, and newts all lived together in harmony, all three civilizations seeing each other as equals. But one day, this frog creature of mysterious origin emerged, and using the magic of the three gems, it absorbed the virtues from the various species of amphibia. It took the bravery of the frogs, the kindness of the toads, and the knowledge-sharing nature of the newts. Obviously, this led to total chaos among the three societies. The toads became ruthless and probably stormed onto the other lands to raid them. The newts no longer shared any information and fought off anyone that tried to take it from them. The frogs probably went into hiding, meaning the farmers weren't growing any crops, so no food for anyone. Basically, a gigantic civil war broke out. Eventually, everything ended with the toads and frogs being sent to the valley, where the toads could rule as harshly as they wanted, and the newts staying at a safe distance away where no one could ever learn their secrets. After the monster was defeated, the three gems were taken away from it and stored on top of the Calamity Box, where they now reside. Slowly, things in Amphibia started to get a little better with time. Like the frogs became brave enough to stand up to certain creatures, the newts opened up their universities to share some of their information, and the toads at least started treating each other with mutual respect. But each species was still missing that one final push that would truly return the spark of virtue that was taken from them. That was when a prophecy emerged, depicting three heroes who would come forth to fight, not just to return what the beast originally stole, hence the magic in his hand, but also to fight off the beast itself if it should ever return. And just as expected, the prophecy came true, with Anne, Sasha, and Marcy opening the box, obtaining the magic from the gem they best represent, and then each getting teleported to the place where the virtue was taken, and to the valley where the frogs live, Sasha to Toad Tower where the toads live, and Marcy to Newtopia where the newts live. And now the girls each need to break through their internal barriers so they can better themselves and bring back the lost traits of the communities they befriended, act as living examples to the virtues that were taken from them, and maybe at one point, take down this monstrosity when and if it emerges again. <sighs> Whew. I am either a genius or a completely delusional psychopath. But hey, either way, hopefully I'm still fun to watch. So yeah, there's my overly complicated theory about how the Calamity Box works. Maybe I'm right, more than likely I'm wrong, maybe I'll be proven incorrect in like two weeks, but we'll have to see. However, we're not done yet. We've talked about the box and the girls, sure, but what about the other big mysteries? Who made the Calamity Box? Who is this mysterious gem-wielding creature? Why does Hop Pop's book say it's so dangerous? Where did these factories come from if they're before recorded history? How'd the box get to the human world in the first place? And how does Amphibia know about alternate dimensions at all? Well, I've got answers for pretty much all of these, and they all revolve around a mysterious leader, a buried past, and the theme of change. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
It's the theme of change. Come on, I don't want it to be too scary. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Tell me what you think of my weird theoretical ramblings. And subscribe for more amphibia and cartoon content coming soon. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.